Well, I'm Elaine Whirl. I'm one of the pediatric epileptologists and director of pediatric epilepsy at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, a lot of people ask, what is epilepsy? Um, what is it about the brain that's, that's different in people who have epilepsy? And all what epilepsy is, is um, abnormal electrical discharge that are coming from certain nerve cells or cells that we call neurons in the brain. And that um, usually leads to clinical symptoms with either the patient losing awareness, um, uh, somebody may have some abnormal movements such as rhythmic shaking activity, abnormal sensory phenomena, weird feelings, um, uh, unusual uh, vision, um, uh, taste, smells, things like that. And um, it can be due to a wide variety of causes. Um, many people who have epilepsy um, potentially may have suffered some type of brain injury earlier in life. Sometimes it can be due to a developmental change in the brain that, that happens before the baby is actually born. Sometimes in that situation seizures can actually not present until you know many years later in life which is a little confusing sometimes to the families. Why, why you know, could this happen now when this was something that had been going on all along? Um, we understand also that many cases of epilepsy um, have um, a genetic component, so there's a number of different genes that when they come together in the right combination in a given patient um, can, can result in, in uh, seizure activity. So epilepsy actually has a lot of different symptoms and it really depends on which part of the brain the seizure starts in, um, how much of the brain the seizure involves. Um, so sometimes it's a very, very obvious seizure, particularly those that affect the entire brain where the person can become stiff, loses consciousness, can fall of, over and have rhythmic shaking, and that's sort of the seizure that most people think about. Um, there are other types of seizures that um, can be much, much more subtle. So sometimes all we see is some very subtle steering, um, and that can be in what we call an absent seizure, and many times those children are unaware that they're actually having um, a seizure. They, they may be aware potentially that they've lost a little bit of time, but there's nothing that actually happens to them during a seizure that, that um, uh, they're aware of that is, that is a seizure. Um, other times people can have seizures that start in one particular area of the brain. For example, if a seizure starts in the back part of the brain, um, many people have a, a warning or an aura. Um, and for example, in the back part of the brain, they can have a visual aura, they can have something funny that they see, a light or a formed object or something like that. If the seizure starts in the um, what's called the temporal lobe, sometimes people can have unusual smells, unusual tastes, um, a sensation that something is rising up from, from the abdomen into the chest. Um, sometimes they can have a fear of, or a sense of fear, a sense that they've you know, been there or seen that before. Um, if it starts in the front part of the brain, sometimes there can be some difficulty with speaking um, or they, there could be uh, rhythmic movement starting in one particular part of the body. Um, so it really depends on where that, that starts and um, how the patient is aware of it. Most of the times people who have seizures that start in one particular part of the brain have some sort of warning and have some at least partial awareness that they're having a seizure, although their um, awareness may then be uh, lost later on if that seizure progresses to involve a larger part of the brain or goes to involve both sides of the brain. So a lot of people are very, um, I think, frightened by the term epilepsy, are very um, scared of you know, what to do if somebody around them would have a seizure. Um, first of all, it would be very, very unusual for the person having a seizure to, um, uh, or for the seizure to cause any um, uh, long-term harm to the person who's actually having the seizure. Um, secondly, uh, people who have seizures do not pose any risk of hurting or harming those around them. So I think people can be very reassured that they can you know, help the person who is having the seizure without any risk to themselves. Um, what we generally recommend is that for, um, if, if you see somebody having a seizure, you roll that person onto their side you don't put anything in their mouth. Uh, the concern that you know people with epilepsy might swallow their tongue in a seizure is really um, uh, sort of an old wives' tale. It's not something that that is really true. So you roll them onto their side. Nothing in their mouth. If there's anything tight around their neck, you want to loosen that. And then you really want to look at your your uh, watch. And if that seizure goes longer than five minutes, which is really uncommon. But if it does go longer than five minutes, that's the, the time that I think you really need to call for help. You need to call um, uh, an ambulance in order to be able to um, have somebody who can then give medication to shorten that seizure. So the diagnosis of, of epilepsy is really a clinical one. So it relies on um, talking to um, one of the doctors or neurologists about um, what symptoms the patient is actually having. Um, it's very, very helpful if the patient can describe those symptoms themselves. And if they are unable to do that, it's, it's very helpful to be able to speak to whoever it was that witnessed the patient actually having the event um, to know if it's a seizure or you know, another um, uh, 
uh, potential cause where there is altered awareness or loss of awareness and there are other things that can do that besides seizures. Um, most often um, after a, a careful discussion with the family, with the patient, um, we'll go on to do an examination. Many people with epilepsy have normal exams so that um, often is not particularly helpful and then we often uh, will proceed to a test called an EEG or a brainwave test. Um, and when we do the EEG, um, many people, not everybody with epilepsy, um, will show some abnormal discharges on their EEG. Um, and sometimes we see people without epilepsy also showing some abnormal discharge, so it's not a perfect test, but it can be very helpful. And then oftentimes, um, and again, not in every case, but oftentimes we will proceed to um, a special uh, picture of the brain, usually done with an MRI scan. So there's lots of different um, uh, ways to manage epilepsy, to treat epilepsy. Um, not everybody needs to be treated. There are some patients who have very, very infrequent seizures, very, very brief seizures, and they may not even need to be on a daily medication. Most people who have recurrent seizures um, or epilepsy um, are started on anti-seizure medicine, and um, most often that's taken twice a day, depending on which medication you're on. Um, and in the vast majority of, of people, fortunately, the medication will actually control the seizures, and the person can achieve seizure freedom as long as they continue to take their medication. Um, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of people um, uh, continue to have seizures despite trials of several medications. And the term that we use for that is medically intractable epilepsy, or some people use the term refractory epilepsy. And that's obviously very problematic because it can have a very significant impact on quality of life. Um, you don't really, um, you're not able to predict when a seizure is coming, and so that can have impact on, you know, your ability to drive, your ability to do particular um, uh, jobs, things like that. And so in that situation is usually when we consider, you know, are there other options besides medicines um, for um, a certain um, subgroup of that, that 30%, 20, 30%, um, those patients may be amenable to um, uh, having a surgical procedure whereby we can identify where in the brain the seizures are coming from. Um, and if that area of the brain is not in, involved in another really important function, we can then actually resect that small area and hopefully uh, result in seizure freedom for the patient. Um, some patients um, can be uh, helped very much by special diets, ketogenic diets and things like that. And then there are some other um, what we would call palliative surgeries, so surgeries that don't necessarily stop the seizures but hopefully will reduce the, the burden of the seizures. Um, there is a, a device that can be placed called a vagal nerve stimulator um, and in some patients who have seizures, um, if they have a warning, the patient can then activate the vagal nerve stimulator to try and stop the seizure in its tracks. So even that can be very useful in patients with difficult seizures. So in most cases, we are managing the symptoms. In many children with epilepsy, fortunately, they have what we call self-limited epilepsy syndromes. And what that means is that the seizures will manifest at a certain age range in children. And then fortunately, as that child grows and the brain matures, they will outgrow their seizures. So I think that in that situation, it's not necessarily our medicines that are helping, but the medicines are, are you know, helping to control the seizures until they're going to outgrow it anyways. And for those children, I think cure is definitely um, very, very likely. Um, other times, if we can actually resect the area of the brain that is resulting in seizures, I think that we can talk about cure. But for many patients, we really are trying to manage the seizures. We unfortunately don't have super good therapies right now that would allow cure of epilepsy for most people. I think that um, when you're looking at epilepsy, um, I think that there's a lot of reason to have a lot of hope. Um, when we look at the majority of patients that we see, we find that we can actually find the right medication that will stop their seizures and that will not um, cause intolerable side effects. So for many people, um, we can achieve very good seizure control on medication alone. And provided we can do that, people can get on with their daily lives. They can, you know, do their jobs. They can drive. They can, you know, marry. They can um, go on dates. They can, you know, do the activities that they want to do. And that's really important. Um, I think that for anybody who has seizures, there are some activities that are potentially a little bit more risky. Um, and so um, particularly situations like swimming, um, bathing, things like that, we suggest that people with epilepsy would take showers rather than baths. And if they are swimming, they should swim with some sort of supervision. I think that there has been a lot of advances in our understanding of um, genetics and epilepsy. Um, and I'm hoping that we are going to be able to use that information once we identify what is the gene that is causing the epilepsy to then be able to then ask the question, well, 
you know, if we know that we have this gene change that is leading to epilepsy, does that help us um, in any way choose the best therapy? Does that, can we really engineer a therapy based on what is wrong with the gene to control the epilepsy? The other area that we've had very significant advances in in the last 15 years or so has been in the imaging sector. And so um, we've really um, been able to identify, I think, more clearly in patients who have difficult to control seizures in that 20 to 30 percent where medicines aren't working. Um, we've really been able to be much more successful in being able to find and localize that area of the brain where the seizures are coming from, um, allowing a larger number of those patients to go forward with surgery and, um, and achieving seizure freedom following that. And I think that right now we're seeing continuing advances in both of those areas.